Good afternoon. I would like to get started. My name is Gavin Yi. I'm the technical director of the I4 Energy Center. Welcome to uh, another of our uh, I4 Energy seminars on, on Fridays. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Francis Rubenstein. Uh, Francis is a staff scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, where he leads the um, Building Technology Department's Lighting Research Group. Uh, he is an internationally recognized expert in advanced lighting controls research. Uh, at the Berkeley Lab, he developed a low-cost building equipment control network that would allow lighting systems and other building equipment to be controlled wirelessly uh, from the internet. In uh, 1993, he was the Department of Energy's lighting expert for the greening of the White House initiative under President Clinton. And lastly, he is a fellow of the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America and currently chairs the Society's uh, research committee. Let's welcome uh, Francis. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for turning out on this, what was promising to be a very windy and blustery day. Um, looks like we've got a pretty big, uh, pretty big crowd here. I know the food always helps attract people. Reminds me a little bit of um, uh, when Winston Churchill was once about to give a was about to give a speech in front of a very large audience, and a woman came up to him and um, said in a treacly sort of voice, "Kind of well, Mr. Churchill, it must be so wonderful to have so many people come out to hear you talk." To which our hero replied, well, yes, madam, it is very flattering until I remember that if I was here not to give a speech but to be hanged, <laughs> the crowd would be twice as large. Um, the reason I'm going to give this talk today um, is kind of give you a little bit of background, a background on it. Um, I um, gave, a, gave essentially a very similar talk to this at the last IES conference um, uh, last November. And in August, I was called by the IES um, uh, conference uh, uh, committee. And they asked me to give a talk, and they asked me to give a talk on the subject of uh, something like how researchers do research, or some incredibly dull subject. And I said, no, I'm, I'm, I don't think I really want to, don't really want to give a, 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 that, that as a topic. But if you want me to give one, why fluorescent lighting isn't dead yet, I'd be happy to do that. And um, they, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, a week later called me back and asked me um, if, I would, if I would, in fact, go ahead and, uh, and, go ahead and do the talk. So. Um, uh, what you'll see in the background there is, I think, what probably a lot of people are starting to think about um, what's happening with fluorescence. That's the, uh, the dinosaur bones there that are on the ground there that are being eaten up by the, uh, the, uh, the mammals there. Excuse me, I get my little laser pointer. <clears throat> so I think this is kind of the, uh, the, the, the common view of, of, what's been, of what's been going on. And uh, let me go to the next slide here. On the left-hand side there is, a, is, a, is, a, is actually a cartoon from the, uh, from the New Yorker some time ago. And uh, the, the little incandescent light bulb there who's crying into his drink is saying, laugh if you will, but my kind once ruled the earth. And then you have these pencil-necked uh, fluorescents um, that are sort of looking on. Of course, this is from the... Did you have a point or something? Yeah. Um, this is from the 1980s, of course, in the in, in 2000s. Um, it wouldn't be the, uh, the incandescent light bulb. It would be the, uh, the fluorescents who were crying into their drinks and the LEDs and the LEDs looking on. So this is the different topics that I'm going to cover in my talk today. I'm going to start off. I'm giving you a little presentation on um, how much uh, energy we use in the United States um, for, uh, for light sources. Um, I'll describe what general lighting is and what are the different types and what are some of the different shapes. I'll describe some of the improvements to fluorescent lighting that have been going on over the last 15 years. Um, and then the, thanks a lot, great. And the sort of the meat of my talk today is gonna to be this area here where I'm gonna compare LEDs with um, some of the fluorescent incumbent technologies. And I'll look at it in today's market, in today's lighting market with today's efficacies and today's prices. I'm not gonna do a 20 year projection ahead kind of thing. And we'll look at these in terms of lumens, that is to say the energy service they provide, the efficacy, the lumens per watt, and then the cost. And then I'll also show you what are some of the environmental implications of a number of different, um, uh, a number of different light sources. And I'll have a little um, uh, digressional sidebar where I discuss the issue of the mercury in fluorescent lamps and how much of a problem that is or is not. Um, and then I will segue into a discussion of how lighting controls, my favorite subject, will, um, can save energy and will help uh, improve the situation in the U.S. 
And then I'll end on talking about um, my concept of hybrid lighting and hybrid luminaires, kind of like the, the Prius, if you will, where I see combinations of LEDs and fluorescents working in well-controlled lighting systems in the future. And um, I, will, uh, I will end the talk on that. So this is now um, a look at um, the U.S. lighting energy use. This is looking, looking at source energy. This is primary energy. Now draw your attention to the uh, right-hand pie here. This shows you that commercial uses a little bit more than 52% of the energy. Res is about a little bit more than a quarter. And then you have, um, excuse me, you have industrial and you have stationary. I always sort of like the, 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 the thing stationary. It's not, as, not exactly like the lights on your ceiling here are moving around at, at large velocity. But what they mean by stationary is outdoor lighting, parking lot lighting, and things like that. That's, what my, that's what's, what's meant by stationary lighting. Now, if you actually take each one of these and blow them up a little bit more in terms of what are the constituent light sources, you see that commercial is the largest and it fluorescent is the largest within the commercial sector. Within the residential sector, it's also pretty big, but it's being dominated um, primarily by incandescent lights, not uh, probably no, no, no great surprise there. Now, I apologize for the staleness of this data. This is from 2001. This actually is the latest data that I can find um, that includes all the fluorescent lighting energy. Um, there has been, however, fortunately, a more recent um, report that was done that looked at, um, since LEDs have been out there for about five or six years now, what kind of market penetration do we think that they've made? And this is from a, I, I have my sources all here so you can go look up to see how correct I've done things. I've listed all the sources right here. So this is from a, a recent uh, report by Navigant Consulting, the Energy Saving Estimates of Light Emitting Diodes in, in uh, Niche Lighting Applications. They estimate that in 2010, the savings from LEDs is on the order of um, about four, um, excuse me, sorry, the usage is about, um, is about a four, uh, four terawatt hours um, per year. Now, general lighting is sort of the topic of my, converse, my, my discussion here. Um, if LEDs are going to replace fluorescence for general lighting, you want to have some idea of what general lighting is. Generally, it refers to incandescent lighting and fluorescent lighting. Um, and uh, shown along the top here are um, two of the different incandescent lamps. This is the, the A lamp. Um, it's essentially a point source for all intents and purposes. Then you have reflector lamps. These are kind of beam shapes in terms of their overall geometry. Then you have fluorescents, which are very definitely a line source. We have a couple of different lamp diameters, the T8 and the T5. This refers to the diameter of the lamp in eighths of an inch. We have two different lamp lengths. We have four foot and two foot. And then we also have straight and folded tubes, as, as, are, illustrated, um, as are illustrated here. And <clears throat> what happens is that um, there is a considerable investment in fixtures that to accommodate these different types, these different, uh, these different lamp types. So there's been, in fact, a very large historical investment in infrastructure for general lighting. And I sort of picked up a few graphics to show you what those are. This is the, um, the, the Edison socket. We have about 4.5 billion Edison sockets in both residential buildings and in commercial buildings. And those, of course, fit table lamps and also fit down lights. So these are some of the kinds of fixtures that we see both in residential and in the commercial sector. Um, and then you see, of course, a lot of these in, the, in commercial buildings. This is your typical 2 by 4 lens trofer, and it uses little lamp holders inside it. But this actually does constitute a, uh, an infrastructure. And what makes it difficult for LEDs is that they kind of have two strikes against them um, in, this, in this particular mode. First of all, they have to accommodate an electrical infrastructure that really wasn't designed for LED replacements. And perhaps worse than that, the incandescent sockets generally tend to work best with point sources. And an LED is de very definitely not a point source. It's very much a beam source. And so you're, we're kind of trying to use it in, in a bit of a funny application, which makes it difficult to come up with um, uh, replacements for the existing infrastructure that use LEDs that actually work well. But there have been some companies that have made some successes on this, and we'll talk about some of that. Let's look a little bit at modern fluorescent lighting systems. I think part of my thesis is that modern uh, lighting, fluorescent lighting systems have not been sitting still while LEDs get better. They've also been getting better, admittedly in more incremental ways, but they have been, but they have very much been, um, been, been getting better. So this is a fluorescent fixture sort of circa 1980. This is what a modern fluorescent fixture looks like. Much, much better optics, much higher reflectivity. If you take two of the T5 lamps, these are the smaller, smaller diameter lamps, and put it in one of these modern fluorescent fixtures, 
you're going to get fixtures efficiencies of about 90%, which is really pretty darn impressive, giving you a luminaire efficacy. This is very much like miles per gallon. This is lumens per watt, miles per gallon, and we're getting about 84 lumens per watt out of these more modern fixtures. Even with T8 lamps, which are slightly less efficacious and run slightly differently, we're still getting fixture efficiencies of 85%. We're only losing 15% of lumens within the fixture, in other words. And we have luminaire efficacies of 74 lumens per watt, which is really not, which is really not at all a shabby thing. In addition, ballasts, these are little sort of mysterious things that sort of sit inside fixtures you don't, you don't, you don't generally see very much. But the ballasts themselves have actually become more efficacious, particularly in the dimming area. This shows three different, the three different types, instant start program, start, and dimming. And you'll notice that dimming is only a little bit less um, efficacious than instant start or program start. So there have been improvements in the ballast business, which have also made um, fluorescence that much more, um, uh, that much more uh, compelling. Um, so now we kind of come to the nub of the talk. And that is, if you're going to use LEDs to replace fluorescent lightings in this application, then you're on a particular battleground where cost is really king. And one needs to recognize that fluorescent ballast performance, fluorescent performance in general, has been slowly but continually improving over, over this time. To paraphrase from Nathan Lewis, um, who is, um, heads up the Caltech's Powering the Planet project, he sells um, green electricity, green electrons for a living. And this is what he says about electricity, but I'm going to turn it around and discuss it in terms of light. He says, we already have light coming out of everybody's light fixtures. This is not a new function we're seeking. It's a substitution. It's not like NASA sending a man to the moon. It's like finding a new way to send a man to the moon when Southwest is already flying there every hour and handing out peanuts. It gives you an idea of what some of the real, real challenges are going to be if LEDs are going to replace fluorescence for this, for this, for this purpose of, of general lighting. We've, we get somewhat blasé, quite frankly, about how good and cheap fluorescent lighting is, that we tend to forget what, in fact, a well-evolved um, tour de force it, in fact, actually is. Something else that these fixtures do is they do a very nice, the lighting designers love this. They do a much better job of lighting the walls than these old fixtures, than these old louvered fixtures. You can see these scalps here. Lighting designers hate these. And they're only about 62% efficient. Now you take the modern fluorescent fixtures, which are either 90 or 85% efficient, depending upon what kind of lamps you put in them. You see we're getting much more efficiency, but not only that, we're getting better lighting quality. We're lighting the walls. We're lighting the walls much better. So this is a great story. Lighting quality improves. Energy consumption ends up decreasing. Now, this is I'm kind of going to kind of get to the main meat of my talk here, where I'm going to compare several different um, uh, LED products here, 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 and here, and compare them to the um, appropriate um, fluorescent um, incumbent technologies against which those LEDs are attempting to are, are attempting to compete. And we'll look at each one of these paired comparisons in terms of lumen output, in terms of efficacy, and in terms of cost performance. Okay, let's start with this one. This is a, um, this is a um, I, I show, by the way, all the, the data is shown here, all the statistics, um, sorry, all the, um, the information on the different lamps is shown here on the left-hand side. This has been recently announced by Philips. It's called the Endura lamp. It's intended to replace the 60-watt incandescent light bulb. Um, just been announced that the price is now going to be 39, I think it's actually 39.95. I think I got it gone wrong by two cents there. 39.95 is what's going to be the price. Um, and what I show, and I'm comparing it now against a pretty much state-of-the-art Energy Star compact fluorescent lamp. Um, and in each one of these comparisons, I'm going to show the same three things. I'm going to show the lamp lumens, which is a measure of the energy service that that product provides. I'll then talk about the efficacy, that is the lumens per watt, miles per gallon, if you will, for those, those, those particular comparisons. And then we'll talk about cost. This is cost now, which we generally in the lighting world express as dollars per kilolumen or dollars per thousands of lumens. And that's how we express cost. Um, now, if we take these two comparisons, this is the LED one. We can see that it's coming in a little bit less lumen-wise. The, um, the, the CFL product puts out 900 lumens and exactly matches the 60-watt incandescent, whereas the LED puts out 800 lumens. doesn't quite match it in terms of energy service. And in terms of lamp efficacy, they're exactly tied. They're basically neck and neck photo finish. They're both 64 lumens per watt. Both coming in exactly the same um, efficacy. Um, there's a huge difference in price here. 
essentially to first order, you're um, paying about 25 times more for this guy than you are for this guy. This guy does have one advantage in that it's going to last at least two and a half times longer. This is a 25,000 hour life where this has a 10,000 hour, 10, hour life. So the advantage, the, um, the, the LED product is certainly going to, is certainly going to last, um, it's certainly going to last longer. This is now another comparison. It's not entirely an apples to oranges comparison. I might almost call this something like an oranges and tangerines kind of comparison. The reason for that is that these really are somewhat different products. This is the, the LED product. It's a spotlight. And this is the CFL product, which is actually a flood. So this is a flood. This is a spot. So they're not actually exactly the same, but um, I think close enough for this comparison. So again, now, if you compare them in terms of lumen output, what you see is they're basically about the same, both coming in at about 500 lumens. Um, if you look at uh, fixture efficacy or lamp efficacy in this case, we see that we, we give the nod to the LED, which is coming in at 42, whereas the CFL is coming in at 33. Go to the uh, cost per kilolumen, and we find once again that the, um, that the LED product is cost much more in terms of the dollars per kilolumen than does the CFL flood. Um, this is coming in at about a, a, little, bit, a little bit over $100. Um, one of the um, definite advantages, though, that this does have over this is lifetime, which this will last four times longer than this thing will. And so you, um, this is definitely an advantage. I want to make a slight digression here. <laughs> this is a spot lamp rather than a flood lamp. Um, this is kind of where an LED is going to do its best. And um, CFLs actually don't make very good spotlights. They make like, pretty crummy spotlights, but they make half decent floods. So um, it's not exactly fair comparison, but I think you know, re reasonably fair anyway. Now I'm going to show you um, a different, um, different type of um, retrofit. These things, we call these downlights, and there are a lot of these in residences and also a lot of these in commercial buildings. Um, the actual housing for these things are dirt cheap. You can get them, the unwashed public, you and I can get them from Home Depot of 10 bucks, dirt cheap. The trim costs a little bit more, but the, the thing itself is really, really cheap. You'd be amazed how cheap they are. Um, and now there's two different products you could potentially put in them to improve energy efficiency. I could put in a, uh, the CFL flood that we talked about before, or I could put in one of these um, new um, LED retrofits. This one's made by Cree, it's the LR6. You can see it's fairly massively um, heat sink there to make sure that you get good long life even under challenging um, temperature, temperature environments. Again, comparing these things here, what you see is that in terms of fixture lumens, again, we're going to give the um, LED retrofit and even the nod in terms of light output. This puts out 650 lumens, whereas this guy only puts out 500, so that puts out a little bit more light. Um, the, in terms of luminous efficacy, the um, LED also gets the, um, wins that, coming in at 62, whereas this is only coming at 33. So definitely the LED retrofit is definitely coming in much better in terms of efficacy at this point. And the color from the LEDs is gorgeous. Don't get me wrong. The color is fantastic. Really, really nice. Um, again, where it falls short here is on price. And you can see how much more. This thing is running generally about 100 bucks. Whereas this thing is um, 120 bucks, I guess, and this you can get for about uh, for about for about 14 dollars. So the um, the LED retrofit is is seven times the cost, but it does last six times longer. Now you got a pretty big. Now you got a pretty. This is 50,000 hours. This is only 8,000. So this thing really is going to last for a lot longer. Now you have to ask yourself, how useful is that in residences where we only use lighting for on average about 800 hours per year? Do you need a light bulb or a fixture that lasts for 60 years in your home? And I'd argue you probably don't. However, in commercial buildings where you often have 4,000 or 4,500 hours a year, then this starts to make a lot more sense. Then the difference in lifetime really does matter because this is a much longer life product and you can avoid all the maintenance of having to replace, replace this, at least, in the, um, at least in the commercial sector. And then finally, we come to the last of these paired comparisons where I'm going to compare the replacement of the, 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 a two-by-two two fixture, an LED um, fixture, against a two-by-two um, uh, two fluorescent fixture. This is with a, the old um, par, um, parabolic, uh, parabolic louvers and has three folded T8 lamps inside it. And um, if you compare these two now, what you see is that the fluorescent with three tubes in it puts out considerably more light than this thing does. This puts out 3,800 lumens, but the fluorescent now puts out 5,185. 
That's with T8 lamps in it. If I put T5 lamps in it, I can get a well of a 6,000 lumens in this. So what we can see here is that in terms of energy, energy service in this product size, we're seeing that the LEDs are struggling to come up with the same amount of lumens that the fluorescents can do without even breathing hard. That is actually a big problem because we don't, you want to have a fair amount of light coming out of each one of these so you don't have to put a whole lot of them, let's say, when you're lighting a Macy's or a store or anything like that. And you'll see these are, these, these are used everywhere. This really is the business case because you get so many lumens out and you get good, 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 good protection. So I think this is an area where I think LEDs are going to really find it very, very challenging to compete with the incumbent technology. The fixture, fixture lumens is not as much, which is definitely not good. The efficacy is slightly higher, and I imagine we'll still get a little bit, a little bit higher still. But the T5 would come up a little bit, would be pretty close to what the LED was doing. And again, you see this very large difference in, um, in, in, in cost. And here we see that really LEDs really just can't even come close. There are times when size matters. And in this particular case, this is a time when size really matters. And not being able to have the lumen output is definitely um, is not good. Um, this now takes all those comparisons and, and kind of maps them all onto one graph. I'm showing you on this axis here is the uh, lamp or fixture lumens. And this is the cost per kilolumen here. Now, in the ideal case, these dots would overlap. In other words, you, would get, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't pay anything more for it for the, new, for the new stuff, and you'd get the same level of energy service. What you don't generally want to see is arrows going upwards, because now, now your replacement product is more expensive than the thing that you replaced it with. And you definitely don't want to see things hang, going over towards the left, because that means you're not able to get the same energy service. So if we compare, for instance, the CFL going to here, it's going upwards, not going left at least. Um, but we're seeing a very big increase in price at the same level of energy performance. In these two cases, we're actually seeing a slight diminution in energy, in, in, in energy service with the, with, the, with, the L, with the LED case. So in each one of these four applications, what we find is that the increase in the dollars per kilolumen is very sizable and sometimes is, is accompanied by a diminution in, um, in service. Okay, I've talked enough about some of the comparisons between LEDs and fluorescence. Now I want to move over and talk about some of the environmental implications. Um, as I'm sure you're aware that any type of lighting product that you make, or any kind of product you make, has environmental implications associated with its uh, manufacture, its transport, its use, and its, um, its end-of-life management. And there's been an excellent study done by Navigant Consulting called the Life Cycle Cost Assessment of Ultra-Efficient Lamps. And what they did there is they looked at all the different life cycle implications of making different lamp, of making different types of lamps. So you have raw material extraction. Here you've got energy, glass, electronics, phosphors, um, rare earth materials, and so forth. You make your lamp and the manufacture that takes energy to manufacture the lamps. Then you need to transport them and package them. Again, that takes energy. But the most of the energy usage comes into the actual the use phase when you're actually providing energy to actually operate the lamp. And then afterwards, you dispose of the lamp, hopefully, and it gets recycled and it gets reused again. So this, but this, uh, what's nice about this report is that it goes through all the environmental implications all the way from extraction all the way to, uh, to recycling. And what they do there is they describe a series of environmental indicators that reflect what the environmental consequences are. And what they came up with, they came up with four different groups. They have air impacts, water impacts, soil impacts, and resource, resources. And within each one of these, they have several indicators. And there's a total of 15 indicators, and I don't want to you know, belabor this point too much. And I'm only going to talk about one indicator in here, which is the one that, which tries to track human toxicity potential and it, it, they derive a unit which is um, a, an equivalent unit of a rather nasty chemical, 1,4-dichlorobenzene. And um, they essentially equate the damage in terms of the, 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 the equivalent production of that, of, of, that, of, that, of that chemical. So let's go ahead and um, look at this. In this uh, report that was done, they look at five different, uh, sorry, excuse me, six different light sources. Again, this is just one of the environmental attributes that was looked at in the study. And here what they plot is they plot the human toxicity. This is not like golf. Bigger is worse. Okay? So the more you go out here, the worse it is. Now, it's weird units. Kilograms of 1,3-dichlorobenzene equivalent per million lumen hours. It's a very strange unit. But that million lumen hours really is a measure of the energy service that you get from a, from a, from a, from a light bulb, which, which, which makes some sense. I was actually somewhat appalled when I started looking at these numbers and actually 
seeing what they really in fact mean, it says that an incandescent light bulb, a million lumen hours is about the energy service I get from burning an incandescent light bulb for, for, for a thousand hours its entire life. It's going to produce three kilograms of this extremely nasty chemical. Wow, that really kind of gives you an idea of that it's not really going to produce that chemical. It's going to produce the equivalent of that. But if you think about that, it kind of gives you some idea of, 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 of how much, what the, the environmental implications are of using energy. Now, the incandescent comes out scoring worse, as one would expect. But what comes out scoring second worst is not the, the fluorescence, but rather is the, the, the two LED ones, the LED integral lamp and the LED dedicated luminaire. Part of this is the fact those massive heat sinks those massive aluminum heat sinks do have environmental implications. Don't, get, don't, don't, get, don't, don't be wrong about that. And that is, that, is, that is reflected here. Now, something else which the report does is they now take, these are the numbers which are based on today's efficacies. They now look ahead five, 10 years and say, hey, the efficacy is going to get better. What's the new situation going to be like? I'm not going to show that. I'm just going to show the numbers that they showed in for, the current, for the current ones. I'm not going to show the ones that they project to. And let me just summarize now on the next slide which is, this kind of summarizes all those 15 vectors, and the one that I was talking about was this one here. But this is now showing you for all these different um, non-hazardous, waste-filled, terrestrial ecotoxicity, eutrophication, all these different environmental um, attributes. And then it puts a, a, a line around for each of the different light sources. And they're looking at um, integrated LED, dedicated LED, a metal halide, a T5, a uh, compact fluorescent, and it's all done comparison to a 100 watt light bulb, which is always the perimeter of this. So you're always comparing against this. This is like golf. Small is better, big is bad. So in this case, the, the one of these which has the smallest circumference, if you will, is the one that has the least environmental implications. And that turns out, lo and behold, to be this purple line here, which is for the T5. The integrated um, LED one actually um, is actually one of the worst ones, except in, in one area here where the, uh, the CFL and the hazardous waste landfill, the CFL does slightly worse in that area. So you can see it's not a slam dunk. You can't necessarily assume that because LEDs are, um, are energy efficient, that they're necessarily going to have less environmental implications than the competing, than the competing, um, uh, than the competing technologies. I'm now going to digress a little bit since we've been talking about environmental issues. I'm now going to have a slight digression now where I'm going to talk about um, the hazards of mercury in fluorescent lamps. Um, I want a colleague of mine, um, well, first of all, misconceptions about the toxicity of mercury in the, in the, in the mainstream consciousness are, I guess, virile would be the expression. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing how much people think that mercury is now like the new plutonium, and if you just look at it sideways, you're going to die. Um, what we did is that, um, and this kind of started with uh, a poor woman in Maine who had the misfortune to break a compact fluorescent lamp in her, in her kid's bedroom. And um, she called some people to, to take care of it. And um, one of the people there said, well, you really need to call the hazmat people, and that's going to cost you $2,000. And of course, that rocketed around the internet as being, I can't believe we're doing these things to people, making them buy these compact fluorescent light bulbs, have all this mercury, which is going to kill them. Um, so anyway, so Maine then started with, um, then actually contracted their environmental department to buy a bunch of compact fluorescent lamps and break them in 45 different ways. I kid thee not. And um, they broke them in all sorts of different ways. And then they measured what the actual, you know, the, the actual outgas in the vapor was from the mercury. And um, they really did break them in 45 different ways. And what we did is we said, OK, we'll take those different ways. And we will compare them to something which people could understand, which is the fact that fish has mercury in it. So he made the equivalent inhaling mercury, and what's the equivalent between eating fish, which has a little bit of mercury in it. And so we sort of did that, did, that, did that equivalence. And what we managed to show was that even if you break it in the worst possible way, it's no worse than eating an extra can of tuna fish. That's as bad as it is, folks. Now, I've told people some of this, and they say, whoa, I'll never eat tuna fish again. <laughs> that can be your response, but I think that's the wrong way, that's the wrong way to look at it. That's the wrong way to look at it. More to the point is that you need to judge risks in this world. And what this says is the risk from breaking a compact fluorescent lamp is a very small risk. And that was the, the, the point that we're really trying to show here. Um, this shows here what some of the different exposures were. So eating a six-ounce six meal of albacore, albacore tuna, you get about 45 uh, micrograms of mercury if you eat, um, eat the entire can of tuna. For the worst case they had, this is the very worst case, it's 50. So again. 
it's, it's, it's exactly the same. If you show any sense at all, it's like eating a nibble of tuna fish. So it's really nothing to worry about. Here it shows that, in fact, our equilibrium body burden, just from eating fish and mercury and your fillings and so forth, we already have a body burden of about 600 micrograms. And look at me, I'm just fine except for this twitch I have. But it's, look, it's, so it gives you an idea of what, the, what, what happens when you, when you, when you, when you, when you uh, the toxicity is something where be worried about it, but not be too worried about it. Okay, we're now going to look at um, what's happening in terms of the um, increase in efficacy from LEDs. It's not a frozen situation. These light sources have been increasing in efficacy over time. And um, this is from a, a, a DOE document. It shows the year here, and it shows efficacy along here. And this is the warm white ones, and these are the cool white ones. Generally, the warm white LED efficacy is coming in around 75 to 80 lumens per watt, which is, which is decent. The cool white LED efficacy is over 100, but it's a real cool white. It's nothing that we would like to use in, in offices or in residences. This difference in efficacy between the cool white and the warm white is not going to change. That's baked into the physics of the problem. That's not going to change. We're always going to have this difference where white LEDs, which are warm white, are always less efficacious by 25 to 30 percent, less efficacious than cool white LEDs. That's not, that, that's not going to change unless we start using different phosphors. Now, let's look at some of the, let's project some costs ahead. This is actually from a study that was done by Navigant actually in 2006. So it's kind of nice. It kind of gives us a, we're half, we're, we're a quarter of the way down the road. Where are we now in terms of energy and where are we in terms of cost? Again, this is cost per kilolumens. This is where, this is where we were in 2007. Now, if you look at the compact fluorescent lamp coming in at two, you can see that even just you know, today or five years ago, rather, we can see how much of a you know, difference there was going on here. Now, this is projecting what they think, and I've done these in, in dash lines because these are projections now. These aren't solid. So these are projections about what we think the LED costs may change as, as, as time goes on. They're, they're expecting to decrease. Um, but don't forget that CFLs are not going to be standing still. If they're $2, if they're $2 per kilolumen, in 2007, I think you'll grant me it'll probably be a dollar by the time you get to 2027. So the goalposts continue to move, even as LEDs do get cheaper. Even as LEDs do get uh, do, do get cheaper in price. Now you'll recall that I said that the Endura lamp, the Philips lamp, actually we actually have a data point there, and that is coming in at right around 50. So in 2011, we're at 50. So we're going to have to do some real fast work to drop those prices by a factor of two in a year in order to keep up with, uh, in order to keep up with things. So um, as one wag once said, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to take those numbers from 2007, and, sorry, 2017, 2020, and I'm going to invert them a little bit. I think people get stupid when they look at these numbers because you're sort of down at the asymptote and you kind of think, well, I'm, I'm close enough, I'm almost there. So I'm going to plot this rather than as dollars per kilolumen. I'm going to plot this as lumens per, lumens per dollar, you know, bang for your buck. And that now really kind of illustrates the challenges that LEDs are going to have to face. This is where they are now. Their heavy lifting has hardly even begun. Now they've got to get from 39 lumens per dollar up to 143 in five years. That is not going to be easy to do. So that's just improved cost performance. At the same time, they also need to improve um, uh, uh, energy performance as well. That is going to be a very, very, that's going to be a real, a real challenge. It's going to be a real challenge to be able to do that. And of course, the incumbent technologies also will continue to improve, although presumably at a slower pace. Let's look at a few um, what I call hybrid lighting solutions. These are solutions which combine fluorescent and LEDs into one solution. This is one that's becoming popular in California. It's called task ambient lighting. The idea there is you put in a much lower level of fluorescent lighting, maybe at 0.5 watts per square foot, put in a lower level of fluorescent lighting, and then use LED task lights or LED under counter, lamp, counter lamps to bring the light levels locally up to, up to, up to um, IES, IES levels. This is a good approach, and I like it. Um, it does have some disadvantages. First of all, desk lamps don't work everywhere. Um, it really only tends to work in office environments and, in, um, uh, and perhaps in university environments. It doesn't tend to work well in a lot of other applications. There's some applications where desk, lamps, desk lighting doesn't even, doesn't even make sense. Perhaps more than that, there are situations where, um, for institutional reasons, you can't do it. I do a lot of work with GSA, 
And it turns out that the people who own the furniture system are not the same people who own the building. And so coordinating a upgrade of the overhead lighting system with an upgrade of the furniture system, of the furniture, lighting for the furniture system, is a real challenge. Those are, those are typically two different organizations, and they're on two different time streams. And so it's very hard to get those coordinated. So it's a great idea, but it's often hard to really do, in fact, really accomplish in practice. This is now a slightly more, perhaps, refined solution, where you're actually now combining um, this is a product by uh, Zuntable. They now actually combine LEDs and fluorescence within the same product. Here you see, um, uh, this is a waveguide here, which is edge lit by LEDs. And this provides a downward light component. And then you use um, the fluorescent lamps in the, in the, uh, along the sides here to provide the ambient light. And um, so here you have, within one fixture, you're now combining LED lighting for the task component, and you're providing fluorescent lighting for the, uh, for, for the general ambient component. So these things are definitely, um, are, are definitely possible, and are start, people are starting to look at that um, more. Um, my idea is that as time goes on, we're going to get smarter and smarter. We're going to start making smart furniture systems, which have built-in things like uh, built-in occupant sensors and built-in light sensors. And those will help to inform not only the operation of the lighting system, but also plug loads and other kinds of things that are going on inside, that, inside the space. So I see occupant sensors, light sensors being integrated directly into the furniture system. And I also see integrated control of task and ambient lighting using controls regardless of the source type. And so I'm going to segue. This is kind of the, one of the last parts I'm going to um, do here. So I'm now going to talk about um, lighting controls. Lighting controls are essentially a way of reducing the amount of waste energy that we waste for lighting. And any control system can be looked at as three components, information, insight, and influence. Information about the lighting env environment, insight about what to change so that you can positively influence that environment, and then finally the influence, the ability to actually change the particular part, part, of, the, um, part, of, the, part of the environment. And this control um, uh, theory, if you will, has result, results in a, in a series of different strategies, daylight harvesting, vacancy detection, personal controls, and so forth. I tend to look at lighting controls as kind of like a quiver of arrows where all the arrows look a little bit different. It's kind of a funny value proposition. So we take advantage of daylight, we dim lights as there's more daylight and so forth. We take advantage of vacancy. One of the ones I really like best in this conversation is personal controls. And what we find is that um, when you give people some personal controls, they actually use it and they save a lot of energy. This is now showing you with a, a modern control system. This is now comparing what GSA was going to do. This was their retrofit compared to a highly controlled lighting system shown here. This has a built-in occupant sensor, built-in light sensor, and you can personally control it, personally control on your own. Um, now, this shows you the results. This shows you the, um, the power density as a function of time. You notice that we go to about 0.6 watts per square foot in the middle of the day, but we have 1.23 watts per square foot installed. So in other words, we have twice as much power installed as we're actually using at any given time. That's the power of controls. It's taking advantage of the fact that people are sometimes not there, and when they leave, it turns their lights off. It gives them some, some, some ability to change the light level to get the level that they want rather than the full-on level. And as a result, you get some very, very significant savings. 40% energy savings compared to a already better than code compliant lighting power density. So we think that um, that's really going to be a very useful strategy going forward. And the thing which is really um, particularly interesting is the use of personal controls. We give people a dimmer, let them choose the light levels that they actually want to be able to do. So this is looking at some of the prior and current work on personal controls. This was a paper by Moore and his colleagues, 2004. They wrote, responsive control systems are capable of, of creating the forgiveness effect. That is, occupants are more likely to forgive shortcomings in the, if they're in an environment if, via control, comfortable conditions can be obtained elsewhere. So in other words, if you make a mistake in your design, if you give them control, they'll forgive you. Interesting, interesting little finding. Been some studies done by NRC and LRC in 2001 where they managed to show increased in vigilance when you have more personal control. There's been some additional studies by NRC, and all this is some of the studies that we're not currently doing at LBL right now, comparing those two systems. And what you see here, this is now, we ask people, the lighting control system allows me to create the lighting conditions I want. This is the old case, which you can see a lot of people say, no, I don't agree, no, I don't agree. In the, in the newer case, where we give them some personal control, not an awful lot, actually, we see more favorable responses. So we're expecting as we give people full personal control that they're going to be even more favorably disposed towards, towards, um, towards what we do. So personal controls is a really, uh, really um, very, important, uh, very important strategy. I learned this the hard way when I gave a, um, a very short presentation to the governor 
Um, this is when um, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger was announcing the, his executive order, executive environmental order. And I'll do a little bit of name dropping here. It's terrible for me. But um, that's um, Dr. Stephen Chu when he was still head of um, LBL before he, um, um, the president tapped him to be the head of DOE. That's um, the Chancellor Bergenau you probably recognize. That woman is, used to be the uh, mayor of uh, New Delhi. Anyway, um, the, the governor came out and looked at all these different technology demonstrations. And I had the, the privilege of, of having a little wireless lighting uh, fixture here that we had programmed to pulse up and down, slowly pulse up, down, up, down, up, down. I had a total of 30 seconds with the governor. And I started describing some of these great technologies and what it was doing and stuff like that. And I made a real tactical mistake. I went and gave him the little printed circuit board, which had the little, had the little um, chip on it. And I noticed to my horror that he was doing this. He's saying, I keep trying to press the button and nothing works. Well, unfortunately, I had not given him a personal control. I had given him just simply a chip. And he immediately thought, he's giving me a personal control. I hadn't been doing that. I'd just given him a chip. So that was my 15 seconds of, of, of fame with the governor. Um, let's just a quick look now in, in, in the future. This is my crystal ball. It's probably as flawed or perhaps more flawed than others. Um, I maintain that where LEDs are going to be really well in the future is going to be in applications like TVs, laptops, and monitors, any app or the traffic signals and signage, anything where you are trying to use light to convey information, LEDs can't be beat. Try to use light to convey information, LEDs are really, really hard to beat. But general lighting is not trying to convey information. General lighting is giving you a blob of light, and then you look at the surfaces, the information is in the surfaces, not in the light itself. And I think that's where it's going, to, it's, going to find it, it's going to find it challenging. It's going to make great head roads in this area here. It's going to be tougher here. It will do well, I think, in beam lamps because the, the, the compact fluorescents make pretty crummy, make pretty crummy spotlights. So I think the LEDs will do, will do well at replacing beam lamps over the next five years. They'll do pretty well, I think, in under cabinet lighting and desk lamps. They'll do well in that. A lamp replacements for very hard to reach sockets. Yeah, I could see it. I could definitely see it. And I think it'll have some effect in downlights in buildings. I showed you that one case where these things do last a lot longer in commercial buildings. That really could be something where, even though it costs much more, could still, um, could still sway the day towards, uh, to towards LEDs. Um, however, I just do want to mention that I'm a terrible businessman. I'm no Kramer. Don't consider this as being any sort of uh, any kind of uh, investment, um, in investment um, information. Well, I'm just now going to conclude with um, uh, some just concluding thoughts. Um, you can see here, this is the president holding a light fixture. This is at the Orion factory, and you can see the president agrees with me. He likes fluorescence too. Um, fluorescent lighting is the most efficient, cost-effective source for general lighting available today. Um, until LEDs become cost-effective with modern fluorescence for general lighting, I would argue that hybrid lighting approaches may be, may be best. Regardless of light source, all lighting should be intelligently controlled. Energy savings isn't enough. Comfort, amenity, and coolness really, in fact, matter more. Um, I am at the end of my talk, and I would be happy to take any questions. Great talk, Francis. <laughs> oh, we got a ton of questions. Let's start with calling you. Francis, I, I uh, read recently something about the uh, uh, effect of uh, LEDs on children uh, in some European report. Do you know anything about that? And what's the story? I think I saw something on that. That was, um, if it's the same one I'm thinking of, it was, a, it was a study that was, it was in French, I think. And my French is better than most. I actually read it through. Um, it, I, I thought it was a very alarmist study. It was, it was, there was a lot of stuff about the brightness of LEDs. And I think they were very concerned that kids are going to stare into these things and go blind or something like that. I, 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 didn't, I did not take it really all that seriously. I thought it was, I, I thought they were bringing up issues that seemed rather, I mean, you'd almost have to outlaw every LED flashlight in order to do what they were, what, what they were saying to do. So if it's the same study, I didn't take it terribly, I didn't take it terribly seriously. I think there are more issues that people have raised with the fact that um, LEDs tend to be very blue or can tend to be more blue. And therefore, um, we have, there's a new photoreceptor that was discovered in 2002, the intrinsically, photo, intrinsically photosensitive retinal, re, retinal ganglial cell. It's a hard thing to say. Um, anyway, that new, um, that new receptor is very sensitive to the blue. And there's some thought that LEDs will stimulate that, 
that photoreceptor and essentially stop us from sleeping well because it turns out that that light actually suppresses melatonin and melatonin is something which helps us sleep. So there is some, some been some concerns about that. The, the, and if you have blue LED street light, for instance, coming into your room at night and things like that, I think it's really overblown, but I think it is, a, it is, potentially, it is potentially a concern. Yeah. Uh, Francis, you sounded pretty confident on the lifetime information. Are, are you indeed that confident that we really know how long the LEDs are going to last? Uh, excellent question. Um, actually, I've very intentionally chosen just products there which are, I think, are being fairly conservative in their lifetimes. For instance, one of the things I like about the Cree products, which are very good products, by the way, they're, I mean, they're overpriced, but they're, they're very good products, um, is that they quote the lifetime, for instance, they'll say, 50,000 hours in an open fixture, but only 35,000 if it's in a closed fixture. So you look at the better companies, they are in fact taking into account these claims, or doing their best to take into account these claims in the, actual, in, in, in the lifetime projections that they do. The trouble is there's an awful lot of snake oil stuff out there where people are saying 50,000 under situations, you go, there's no way this thing is going to last 50,000 not in a million years. So, Gary. Hi, Francis. So I'm interested in supporting and encouraging emerging technology. and. You told us today that fluorescents are pretty good and LEDs are going to have trouble catching up. If you were wanting to make the argument that there ought to be subsidies and financial supports to help LEDs emerge in the market, how would you argue that they're better and consequently ought to have that support? It's a very good question. I mean, I think that as long as, you're look, as long as you're looking at 5x and 10x types of multipliers, what role should, say, utilities and so forth play in trying to incentivize things? My, myself is, I, my, my own feeling is I don't think that utilities should incentivize things at 50% and 75% levels. I think if you're going to get something, you should feel some of the pain yourself. Maybe get a little bit from a rebate, but you should feel some of the pain yourself. So I think it's going to be difficult for them to see how that's going to really drive it down that much, um, unless the utilities are basically saying, hey, we're going to do all the heavy lifting for people who are going to use these things. And I suspect that's probably not going to, not going to work out very well. I do want to indicate, though, that my, 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 I'm actually very bullish on LEDs. I'm just not that bullish on them in general lighting. I think if you look at a lot of the, quote, niche applications, which are often disparaged, those are great applications. Those are very lucrative applications. We're going to see a lot of products coming out that use LEDs that are going to be great products moving forward. There's no question about that. Um, my, again, my thing is that, that it has been proposed that it's going to be to replace general lighting, and that's why I'm sort of bringing this up as, hey, these are the barriers that you're going to face when you're, when you're, when, when you're, when you're doing that. Yeah, on, uh, I know that a lot of electronics, they use the Ross, I think, uh, requirement to get all the hazardous waste out. And I haven't seen anything showing that the LED lighting has, you know, the, meets the Ross. I think it's the Ross standards that we used to have to get the lead out for solder. And, and, and Europe is pretty strong on that. And I was wondering how, you know, the incandescence, the LEDs rate with that, I guess. Uh, that's a good question. And actually, it has come up recently. People are now starting to be at least a little bit more realistic when looking at LEDs and realizing that, you know, hey, like any other products, they do have some negative implications associated with them. Um, <clears throat> lead is certainly one of them. I don't know that that has been something which has necessarily caused too much consternation, let's say, in Europe. Um, certainly Europe is, I'd say, probably even more bullish on LEDs than we are here. It could come up, though. It could come up. And certainly LEDs do have some nasty materials in them, you know, gallium arsenide and things like that. Um, myself, I think that it's, I think the hazards are overblown. It's sealed. It's not going to go anywhere unless you crush it up and do something like that. So I think it's overblown. But it's not to say that it's not real. I think that these are issues. And I think we're more and more going to have to pay attention to them and stop looking at it as if basically, you know, there are no hazards associated with LEDs. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you, can you comment on... I'm sorry. This gentleman's been... Can you comment on uh, work being done to enhance the color spectrum from fluorescent lights? Or I don't know if it's... Um... There has been a little. I know there's some work to, to create a, a, a better CFL that has you know a little bit more red in it. That's a little bit more you know a little bit more you know human types of colors. <coughs> there's been some work that was proposed like on a two photon phosphor. You know, really just you know trying to make get, get one photon one energetic photon converted into two lower energy photons. 
very little work has been happening on that as far as, as far as I can tell. I would say relatively little. Relatively little going on that area other than some incremental changes, um, like say with the compact fluorescence, people are looking at adding some additional red to improve the color, the color rating. But I haven't seen an awful lot of interesting developments in the phosphor, in the phosphor area. I was wondering about these. Um, uh, I bought a, recently I bought a mini light flashlight, and one had um, a LED bulb in it. It was mm -hmm. very bright, and I took it home, and my friend said, oh, that's bad for the eyes. Return it immediately. So I did, and I bought the ordinary one. Uh, uh, is it harmful to the eyes well, to look that, at It's very, very much the same question that I, that I think that, that, that Carl was answering. I mean, the answer to that is if you take anything bright and you stare at it, yes, it's going to be harmful to your eyes. But you look, you, 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 you look like you know, you're not going to do that, right? You're going to do it, and you're going to man, that hurts, and you're going to stop doing it. So it's like what your doctor said: if it hurts, you know, don't do it. You know, so I'm, I'm finding that difficult to be a problem. Maybe with babies who don't have the choice and they can't turn away, but unless you're saying you bought that flashlight, and you're going to be staring at it all the time. I'd say, keep your flashlight. It's a great flash. LEDs make great flashlights. <laughs> don't stare at it for long periods of time. Excellent presentation, Francis. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, quick question. Michael Savinovich uh, gave a presentation last August where he showed using LEDs for wall lighting. Uh, you know, you said special purpose lighting is definitely things that are uh, potential for LED. What potential do you give this concept of a completely lit wall to do overall space lighting. Do you think that has any value? <clears throat> My sense is probably not, but I could be. I, like I said, I don't, I don't necessarily trust my, my, my crystal ball. I can imagine that maybe in the future that's going to be, I mean, I've seen a lot of science fiction too. I can imagine a situation where people are like, hey, this is just what I want. Um, my suspicion is probably not. I, I do see a time, for instance, when OLEDs, for instance, which obviously are going to make are going to make nice panels. I could see those being used for you know almost like on the you know Minority Report kind of thing, where you know you got these huge displays where you're doing all this you know doing all this doing stuff with, with. But I think as far as again, it's if it's conveying information, it's going to do well. If it's just to show the well, actually in, in that case, you might actually be showing a scene. You might show some. Some uh, a scene of a savanna or uh, or what of trees or something like that. Um, whether we're going to do that with LEDs, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, I think that's it. That's Thank it. you very much. Francis. Thank you.